Okay, so welcome everyone to the webinar. Um, it's going to be a couple more minutes, so I'll give an extra two minutes and then we'll begin. Um, so yeah, thank you again. Thank you for waiting so patiently. Okay, so it's two minutes past 11. We've got 56 people attending, so thank you everyone for attending the webinar. Um, so my name is Alex Claro. Some of you may have heard from me before, may have spoken to me. Um, I'm one of the solutions architects here at Perdicom. Um, so I specialize in Ruckus predominantly, but I do touch on other products such as the WatchGuard. You may have heard from me before. Um, so let's begin. So the agenda today is basically gonna be a Ruckus ICX switching overview. Um, Q&A with live demo, so we've taken all of your questions that you very kindly submitted um, and we'll be showing you those later on uh, and giving you the answers to those questions. Um, please, please feel free to pause and ask any questions as we go. This is an informative format, uh, an interactive format, so please do stop at any time. So, um, let's begin. So we're going to start off with the, right at the start of the platform, we've got our Ruckus range of switches. So we've got everything from our access layer to our aggregation slash core layer. So we're going to start off with this 7150. So our 7150 is a great switch. It's the entry level switch that we use for most, most platforms in fairness. Um, it comes in a variety of different flavors. It comes in 24 port, 48 port. There's either a one gig fiber version of it. There's also, um, as I like to call, the Big Beast, which is a 7150ZP series switch. So this switch will um, do multi-gig support as well as uh, BT standard for the latest AX access points. I can even power devices up to 90 watts, along with having redundant power supplies. We then come on to our 7250 range of switching. So our 7250 range of switching, um, this, can, this is basically one level up from the ZP series switch. Uh, and what this can then do is it can have uh, layer three and GRE capabilities as well as efficient ethernet standards. What we can also do with this platform is we can have DC power feed. So if you may want to have mains feed on one of the power connections and then a redundant EPS shell, you can do that also. What we can then also do um, is it comes with eight uh, SFP ports on the switch in addition, whereas the 7150s only come with four, unless you buy the ZP switch, which does come with eight. This then leads us on to our 7450 range of switches. So this is where we start to get modular, where we can have um, QSFP ports, SFP plus ports as well, 10 gig copper ports. There is also a fully fledged fiber switch as well. So 48 ports, one gig fiber, with the option to have 10 gig or 40 gig uplinks as well. This also provides resilient fans and resilient power supplies. We then move on to our 7650 series of switches. This is where we start to get into our real aggregation or core layer. So the 7650 is either a 10 gig copper or 10 gig fiber switch. So 24 ports will be 10 gig, the other 24 ports will be at one gig. What we can then also do is we have, again, redundant power supplies and fans, but this is where we start to get into the 100 gig era of networking. So the switch actually has 100 gig uplink ports at the rear of the switch. So you've got a lot of throughput. We support VRRP, um, high performance. We can also do multi gig if you go for the PoE option again. So we can do two and a half gig, five gig and 10 gig, um, or just have a full 10 gig aggregation layer switch. 
we then come on to our 7750 switch. So our 7750 is a pure aggregation of core. This is going to be a 48 port switch where it can do campus fabric, the highest support out of all the switches, it can do 10 gig or 40 gig. Um, it's just a really heavy duty switch. And then it comes on to the latest edition, which has won many awards, um, which is the 7850 switch. So this switch comes in a variety of flavors. It can either do 100 gig networking all the way through, so 32 ports of 100 gig, um, or it can just be a full 10 gig switch with modular breakout for all additional 100 gig ports at the rear of the switch. So again, this comes with redundant power supplies, redundant fans, um, can support all the protocols. It's got 6.4 terabytes of switching throughput. It can be stacked. There's no, there's no area where ruckers can't slot a switch into from the very beginning to the very top of the switch uh, stack. So then we go on to our traditional core and access layers. So other vendors, and I obviously I'm not going to vendor bash, so I can't name them, will tend to recommend you go for a chassis type solution. So what are the problems with this? Well, you've got a complex networking architecture with too many layers and too many interactive links. You've got many different points of management. It's high upfront and maintenance cost because you've got to buy a chassis and then you've got to buy the line cards as well. And you often end up with underutilized chassis. I'm sure, I'm sure we've all been there. We've gone to swap a network out. We've looked at the chassis and gone, you've only got two line cards in here, but that's taking up six or seven years worth of space. It's inefficient and it consumes a lot of power as well. The other problem is that with a lot of chassis, you have to upgrade in bulk, which means you have to replace the entire chassis at times when you want to go to the next upgrade path, which isn't really ideal and it's quite expensive. So what Rockers believe in is a collapsed core and aggregation layer. So we will collapse all of those chassis switches down into just one flat layer, so core and aggregation. Why is this beneficial? Well, you get a lower upfront capital investment we can scale out and pay as you grow networking because all the switches can be stacked. So if you need an additional um, switch in your core stack, add another switch in. It's a lot cheaper. Think of it as like adding a line card in instead of having to add in another chassis or having a chassis sitting there idle. We get increased scalability because we're so flexible on the stacking feature set and campus fabric and other technologies we have at our disposal. We can also do distributed chassis with long distance stacking. So um, I'll touch on this later in the webinar, but we can actually stack up to 40 kilometers on some switches, 10 kilometers on all the other switches. So we can stack a huge distance if we wish to do so. The other benefit is that we get reduced power cooling and footprint as well. So less switches um, and we have reduced power as well because we're only powering what we actually need. So if we take that one step further, we can do a collapsed access layer as well. So again, scale out pairs of grow networking. We have greater scalability. We get flexible network deployment options as well because we can deploy this in however many different ways we'd like to and just add in the switches that we need. We get lower power consumption as well. And that then leads us on to Campus Fabric. So Campus Fabric, some of you may have heard of this before. It's basically a method of having a core stack manage all of your other switches on the estate. So for those of you who aren't looking to go for the smart zone or manage your system via the smart zone product, which Ruckus offer, you could use Campus Fabric if you're using a 77 or 7850 switch. Now, this collapses multiple layers into one logical area. Now, the benefit of this is that you'd only have to buy an advanced layer 3 feature set, for example, on your core switching, because all the switching and routing happens at the core of the network, which means that all the capabilities are spanned across the rest of the network. So this eliminates deployment complexity, simplifies network management. It means there is no spanning tree design because the core switches are handling all switching and routing at that point. It creates a large management domain, so eliminates individual switching touch points, reduces configuration errors, and can manage over 1,700 ports via one switch. So you log into one interface to configure every single switch point on your network. No longer do you have to remember the IP address of every single switch, you just have to remember the IP address of your core switching, which hopefully everyone can do quite easily. Um, and then you manage all your entire switch estate via that one single pane of glass. So this combines premium and entry level switches together into one logical switch, and it can share advanced layer two and layer three services over one, one network. So it keeps costs down as well. So if we move on then to multi-chassis trunking, so maybe 
you've got want to take a different approach. So normally when you have a stack switch, like you sometimes do with canvas fabric, the problem you've got is that you need to do a firmware upgrade, which means you normally have to reboot the switch to take advantage of that. So the issue with that is that you're then gonna to have to schedule a maintenance downtime as a result because of the fact that you are having to reboot the switch for maintenance. So what multi-chassis trunking does, um, and I apologies, there is an error on this slide, it's actually supported on the 7650 as well, um, going to switches, it means you can actually have two independent switches, they're treated independently, but to every other switch on the network, it acts as one switch. So your, all of your edge switches have a link aggregation group or LACP group connecting to those other switches, and it makes it look like they're a single switch. Now this is beneficial because you've got no single point of failure, you've got integrated loop detection because you're using lag groups across the entire switching estate. The other benefit is you can upgrade the firmware on say the MTC switch one or MTC one, and then all the traffic is gonna be diverted to MTT switch two. Once MTC switch one has had its firmware upgrade complete and it's reloaded back and ready to go, traffic resumed as normal, shared between the two switches, and it's an active active configuration. So then you can then upgrade MCT switch two, and again, it's gonna happen that all the routing is gonna be handled solely by MC, MCT switch one. So you've now got no downtime, and you can do this live in any deployment, and you won't notice a single ping drop. So it's really easy, sub-second failure detection and allocation of traffic, and no one notices any difference. I've deployed this in insurances, uh, insurance companies, and I've also deployed this in hotels, big, large hotels where they can't have any downtime. And one of the tests is, the IT manager literally putting the power cable out the first switch and making sure that you can still do a video call. So it's a really powerful way to actually design your core network and hopefully gives you some food for thought. Um, yes, it does um, require mesh topology, so you do have to use link aggregation, so you do have to have um, an OACP group in play and you do have to have a connection to both switches in order for that mesh topology to function. So then coming on to stacking advantages. So um, unlike other vendors, um, we just use standard, standard DAT cables or direct attached cables or SFP modules. Um, uh, so we don't rely on proprietary question uh, cables or connectors. We can do long distance stacking up to 40 gig, uh, 40 kilometers, sorry, or uh, the 7150 switches actually go up to um, 10 kilometers. We can have up to 12 units in a stack, as well as in-service software upgrades. So with in-service software upgrades, we can upload the firmware live, and then the firmware only takes effect upon reboot. So we can have it sitting there. We also have multiple partitions as well. So we've got two partitions, so we can have an active backup firmware. We have hitless failure of management. So what that means is, um, we can actually pull the master switch out the stack and the slave switch or the backup switch will take over as the master node. And then once it's taken over as master node, another slave is elected. So there's always a master slave in the ICX stack to make sure that you've got a fully resilient stack topology. Now this does require that you have a linear or rather ring topology, as you can see here, where every switch is connected in a basically a loop and you need to have a 10 gig license on your switch. So as long as you've got, you're using a 10 gig SFP port and you've got the re required license for that, you can stack accordingly. Um, I can see a few people are um, asking a few questions. Um, so what I'll do is I'll get back to everyone at the very end when we get to our Q&A um, and I'll answer them all in one big bulk. So we get simple setup and deployment. So we have an interactive setup. So when we actually type in stack secure or stack interactive setup, the master switch or the master node will actually say, I can see these other downstream switches, would you like me to make them a stack? Yes or no? Yes, I would. And then you can actually go and number the switches if you want to do so, or let the ICX platform take care of that for you. We can then also begin a simple guided setup, as I just mentioned, and guide a step-by-step -step walkthrough for stacking, but also initially setting up the switch. There is a wizard that you can follow, and it'll ask you how you'd like the switch set up. That allows you to have zero touch provisioning as well for the stack. There's no additional cost as long as you've got your 10 gig licensing. That's all you need to have on the switch. So you can purchase the rucker switches with 10 gig uh, licenses fully intact. Or if you have a one gig switch, for example, 
Um, you can upgrade to Tangy later on down the line, so it's quite flexible in that as well. There's no additional modules required because we don't use proprietary stack connectors. We just use industry standard either SFP modules or standard based stack cables. And we're not picky and choosy, unlike some other vendors. We do allow any module to work for the ICX switch. So why do we care? Well, we get greater scalability, reduced costs. We use no stacking cables. We use standard uh, SFP modules um, and licenses as well. Simpler management, flexible deployment and high availability as well. And again, we can do long distance stacking up to 40 kilometers. So another product that we've got in our arsenal is we can actually do VPN from the 7450 switch. So this is one of the few switches in the world where it actually has a hardware dedicated IPsec VPN module. So you have one per stack. You use hardware assisted AES 128 or 256 with Ike V2 encryption. We can actually support up to 100 tunnels per module. We obviously support IPsec support. We have 10 gigabits throughput um, for the IPsec tunnel and we're fully FIP certified and Suite B compliant. And we operate with any standard IPsec implementation. So you may want to use this in a few use cases. So one of them being that you want to have different VLANs or different subnets routed back to your corporate head office, but you've got a really cheap uh, router at site and it can't handle VPN connections. Okay, well, allow the 7450 to be your core switch and allow it to form the VPN connection back to your office. So it's quite an efficient way to have a switch that can also do everything in one, one method and it will do different VPN tunnels as you can see here, or in different use cases, you've got different branch offices that all need to have a IPsec tunnel back. So enable secure connectivities and the branch offices can access the resources centrally without you having to worry about purchasing a firewall or have a really expensive firewall to manage all the traffic. Let the 7450 do the hard work for you with the IPsec module. And then we come on to VRRP. So any Ruckus switch can actually act as a layer three router. Um, all switches come with either a switch or routing firmware, so you can choose which one you would like. VRRP is one of those advanced feature sets where you actually require a layer 3 premium license. But when you do that, effectively what it means is we can support some routing protocols like VRRP. So those of you who are familiar with Cisco will know that Cisco uses HSRP. Um, VRRP is the open standard implementation of HSRP. So VRRP is a standard based protocol gives you the ability to prove, uh, provide IP gateway redundancy for edge devices. Um, secondary routers will effectively monitor and take over the active link. So if you've got a core switch that fails and you've got another core switch sitting idle effectively or sitting handling traffic, it will then become the router for that network. So you have sub millisecond swap over to keep the network functioning as well. What Ruckus have decided to do is go one step further. They've used VRRP hyphen E, which is an enhanced version of VRRP. So this allows you to make sure your default gateway is pingable across all devices, because um, sometimes it's not always the case. So even when the master gateway fails, secondary routers will respond to ICMP requests. You get more granular control of trunk port management. Unlike the standard, multiple trunk ports or uplinks can be monitored. So you can actually see, well, this link has gone down. I would like to fail over my topology to the secondary uh, backup VRRP router based on this. Um, provides the ability to configure a failover when a threshold is reached. So if your you know, ping results go over a certain latency, you can actually also cause a failover as well. We can also use enhanced additional security allowing for MD5 authentication. So going on to our ICX guided zip package. So um, we do actually come on to this a bit later on as well, because we do talk about the differences between uh, UFI and non-UFI uh, software versions. So what Rocks have got is the guided ICX package. So we can group all of the firmware in one zip file, and it's got all the documentation, all the release notes, all the readmes. Um, they're broken into logical guides, depending on the product that you're downloading it for. So you get examples of layer two features, command references, security, stacking, monitoring, and management. Um, we also get release notes along with a feature support matrix included to show you what features are supported with which firmware, pardon me, um, and which switches support different types of scenarios as well. Um, and that's all found at the support.ruckuswireless.com website. So licensing. So 
we don't have much in the way of licensing with Ruckus, but there are a few little gotchas that we have. So if you're trying to stack a switch, you need to make sure the switch has a 10 gig license or a 10 gig uplink port. A lot of the switches that Perdicom will recommend will come with 10 gig licenses. So if you ever ask us to build you a bill of materials um, and we think you require 10 gig for stacking, we'll automatically do that for you. Um, so that's a nice thing that we can do. Now it's a permanent license and can be pre-ordered and pre-installed onto the Ruckus device, or you can order it separately after delivery. What we also allow you to do is we allow you to test licenses. So for 45 days, if you want to test VRRP or test a different feature set, which uses a different uh, advanced layer three feature, or you, know, you need a 10 gig license, you can actually self-authenticate, put the license code in, or rather um, use the license command, and it'll actually give you 45 days worth of access to trial that license. Um, now, the 10 gig is a little bit weird and wonderful. The 10 gig, although you do need to have a license for it, it actually doesn't revoke after 45 days. But if you do raise a Rucker support question, the first thing they're gonna look at is whether you have the required licenses on there before they can assist. So it does like to provide some testing as well to pay as you grow. So as I said, you get port on demand. So if you need to upgrade to a more feature set later on, you can upgrade your port speeds. You get layer three base licenses. That is actually available on every switch out the box. Um, every switch can do layer three pre, uh, base license. You can then upgrade to a layer three premium license. This is where you, if you need VRRP, OSPF, all the really advanced um, layer three feature sets. Um, you then can also do premium max set, so you can do max security as well. So Q&A, so um, I'm gonna do the Q&A which I've got in front of me on our Teams matches that my lovely assistant Carla is posting for me. Um, and then we'll go through the other questions that everyone's provided for us. So in what types of deployments is Campus Fabric recommended and not recommended? So um, it can, there isn't really a best place for it. So obviously there's a limitation on how many switch ports you can manage. So you've got 1700 switch ports, which equates to I think about 32 switches. So anything more than that, obviously Campus Fabric wouldn't be able to manage. But I've seen it deployed at campus universities. Um, so it can be deployed everywhere. The one thing to know is that with Campus Fabric, it can't actually be um, managed by the Smart Zone platform. So if you're looking to use the Smart Zone platform, which we'll come on to and do a demo of on this webinar, then actually I probably wouldn't use Campus Fabric in that sense because you can do a lot more with a single pane of glass that is in the Smart Zone. Um, does the Iris software add the 10 gig license if you are stacking? Great question. So Iris will actually automatically try and choose the right switch for you. So if you try and form a stack link in Iris, Iris will say that you don't have the required ports. So it'll actually try and upgrade the license anyway and add it to your bill of materials. It is worthwhile checking because they are still working on Iris and making it a bit more intelligent. So it's a bit hit and miss is the honest answer, but just be aware of that because if it says that you don't have the port required, then you know you don't have a 10 gig port and you need to add in the license or um, change the switch provisioning on Iris to do that for you. Um, can we have the details on the GNS3 appliance VI6 switches? Is this an official thing? Um, I'll be honest, I'll need to get back to you on that one. Um, so Andrew, what we'll do is we'll take your details and I'll email you separately um, because I'm actually not too sure at the moment. Um, I think you can get it in GNS3, but I've not tried. Um, okay, so that is all the questions that I can see so far. So we'll actually go through um, the Q&A that other customers have asked. So is it all CLI or is there a web GUI? Um, no, it's not all CLI. There is a web GUI that you can do. So the web GUI, as you can see, it is pretty basic. It is um, not very pretty, but there is a web GUI you can use. We support HTTP and HTTPS, and you can disable HTTP if you're security conscious as well. Um, interesting to see what the virtual smart zone can do and how you would configure slash manage them. Okay, so um, let's do a live demo of what you can actually do with a smart zone. So bear with me, I'm just gonna swap over to that now. So hopefully you can all see my screen. So this is Ruckus Unleashed, but I'm gonna to go to our smart zone platform. 
Um, Eugene, yes, we will be sending um, all the slide references as well as the video recording at the end of this deck um, to make sure that everyone can have a copy of it. So this is our production smart zone in the office. So apologies, you're probably going to hear my mouse clicking a lot. My mic's a little bit too sensitive. Um, so here's how we manage our switches. So you can see we've got all of our Perdicon switches and we've also got a warehouse switch. So I'm going to give an overview and then I'll show you what you can actually do. So from the very get-go, so this is a technical switch, Perdy03. You can see it's in a stack. You've got acting and standby. You can see how many ports are up. You can see how many ports have been flagged and how many ports are down or disconnected. We can then scroll along. Ooh, if I combine this back again. So we can actually scroll along and see how much uh, total PoE we have available. So we're using 473 watts out of a possible 3,000. So here we can see the PoE utilization. Um, we can see the uptime. We can see the firmware level of the switch. We can then also see any default gateways that we've got configured in addition. But what we can then also do is look at our configuration. So in our configuration, we can actually add um, VLANs. So we can actually view the different VLANs we have available. So if I would like to modify VLAN 10, for example, I can modify VLAN 10. At the very bottom, it's going to allow me to decide my untagged ports or tagged ports. I can schedule the configuration for later. Um, we can also then enable DHP snooping, spanning tree, rename the VLAN if we wish to do so. What we can then also do, bear with me, is create a brand new VLAN. So let me just cancel out of this for the moment. And we're going to create a new VLAN here. So it's going to appear down the very bottom again. Um, so you can provide the VLAN ID, VLAN name, port configuration, and choose which ports are going to be applied to, and decide when we're going to schedule the firmware. We can also then copy configuration to a switch or copy from another switch as well, as well as doing anything switch specific. So we can actually go onto the switch itself um, and modify something on specifically on switch three, enable jumbo frames, allow it to be a DHP server if we wish to do so. We can implement an access control list as well. One of the features that I really do like is the backup and restore. So not too long ago, I had to change all the usernames and passwords on the switches and I forgot to write down what the password was. So um, what I actually did is I did a config restore so here you can actually view the config differences. So anything highlighted in yellow shows you the differences in configuration. So you can actually go back and see what an engineer has done and notice when they made a change and actually modify that configuration back to what it was previously just by clicking on one of the configurations and click restore. You can also view, download as well. On the ports view, you can then actually modify each and every port individually. So here you can see we've got different VLANs. Ooh. So it's going to show you the entire switch look and feel. So here you can see we've got a Ruckus um, AP plugged into port two of this switch. You can then actually go through and see how many port or what each individual port is using as well. But we can actually go on to the warehouse configuration if we'd like to do for this specific port. We can turn the port from off or on, change the tagged VLANs, enable PoE, disable PoE, enable LLDP. What we can also then do, looking at an overview, is actually see which VLANs are tagged or untagged. Anything untagged is going to be in blue. Anything not in blue, or rather anything that's grey, it will be a tagged VLAN. We can also then see our neighbouring switches. So we can actually click on this link here, and it'll actually take me to the Unit 4 technical switch and show me what's connected. And we can do this for all of them. So we can see all the different VLANs, we can see the different auth method methodologies as well as well as actually creating a lag group setting as well directly on the switch. So here we can see we've got a lag group. If I click configure, it's going to show you that I've got a lag group connected and I've got selected ports. So I can actually add more to that lag group as well if I wish to do so. Okay, so moving on to the health status. So, okay, the health status is pretty boring, but we can see our CPU, our memory utilization. If any of the fans have an issue, um, so if there's a power supply that's plugged into the switch but disconnected, it'll actually flag an alarm in the smart zone and tell you that you've got a power supply disconnected. So you can actually go and monitor or modify what you need to. We then actually look at traffic as well. So we can look at the last 14 days worth of traffic. So it's going to be quite low considering that none of us are in the office. We're all working from home. But you can actually see how much data have you been using over a certain point of day. You can also see, for example, that we've sent 
over our uh, link to the warehouse, 4.8 terabytes of data. Sorry, that's not the warehouse, that's actually our main uplink. So we can also look at any alarms and events, as well as looking at LDP neighbors. So this is a really handy feature because we can actually see what APs we've got connected from Ruckus, the firmware that they're connected to. We can look at the local port as well and see which port it's connected to, as well as device name. We can also look at any LLDP neighbors. So here you can see we've got a Cambium switch, which we use for testing. We've got a VoIP phone. We've got our demo ICX switch connected as well. Um, we can also see the local ports and remote ports of where it's connected. So it gives you a full overview as well. And we can also pick up any firmware that they've got on those devices if they're displaying that to us. We can then also look at any wired clients. So we in the office actually use radius for authentication and MAC authentication. So we can tell you the authentication type, the device MAC address, the port it's connected into, whether it's done MAC authentication or client authentication, um, and whether it's um, in the right VLAN. Okay, so one other thing we can do is actually look at the system. So we can actually do a general overview configuration. So if we have a brand new switch that we would like to auto deploy, what we can do is create a common configuration element for it. So we can create a common configuration. We can type in DNS, type in AAA, create any AAA servers we would like to log in, whether that be re local or radius configuration. What we can then also do is do any model specific configurations. So again, this is before, um, this is ideally for those types of switches where you've got the same kind of switch going in, in and out all the time. So 7150, for example, you can actually configure, create the ACL, create the VLAN, and the switch will automatically pull in this configuration every time, providing it's a brand new switch fresh out the box. So I'm just gonna switch back to the questions for now. I'm interested in the PF or ZP switches. Okay, so we have a couple of switches. So I've just done a comparison between the 48 PF and the 48 ZP 7150 range, because these are the most common ones that we sell a lot of. So, um, the, oh, we'd like to know about, sorry, we have got another question about, would you like to know about firmware downgrade procedure? Um, so you can actually downgrade the firmware via the smart zone as well. So if you need to downgrade it, you can schedule the firmware as well as downgrade the firmware and schedule the time of day that you'd like to do that. So that's all fully capable from the smart zone platform. It's effectively just injecting the CLI command um, into the switch and doing it for you. Um, so going back to our question about the uh, switching, so we've got our, the 715048PF only comes with four times SFP plus ports, whereas the ZP model comes with eight times SFP ports. The PF series switch comes with 48 times 10100 PoE plus ports, whereas the 7150P, uh, ZP comes with 16 multi-gig uh, ports as well as supporting uh, 82.3 BT, so 60 watts and even 90 watts of power, as well as having the rest of the ports being uh, 10100, 1000 capable ports in addition. The PF series only comes with a single power supply and it's only 740 watt capable, whereas the redundant power supplies in the ZP allow you to actually cater for 1480 watts POE capable. The PF series of switch only has uh, fixed fans, whereas the ZP series of switch has hot swappable fans. So hopefully that gives you a good comparison between the two models of switches um, and the differences between them. Typically, um, for those who would like to have every single port with PoE, we would go with the P uh, ZP series of switch, mainly because it can have 1500 watts of power. That's the only reason. And also it gives you that future proofing if you want it for the latest AXAPs, which do require BT. So that's the R750 model. So how does it compare against Cisco and HP uh, and Netgear? So um, horses for courses, we're all very similar on the throughput. So the main differences are that when you want to stack Cisco and HP to a point, do make you use proprietary connectors, whereas ICX doesn't. So ICX doesn't really care what your, what your connector is as long as it's a 10 gig cable interface and SFP or DAT cable. Um, throughput wise, we're very similar compared to HP and Cisco. The main difference is that HP will tend to recommend the ZL series with chassis switch. The problem is that it tends to be underutilized, whereas we can actually just use a single one use slot. Um, 
going against Cisco, again, they like to use uh, chassis switches. We're also often very much cheaper compared to Cisco on price point. Um, again, similar pricing, if not cheaper than HP. The nice thing is that if you are integrating it into the smart zone, the smart zone platform is fully featured. So you've got a single pane of glass, you can do everything from it, whereas Cisco and HP tend to try and force you down the road of buying a third party or a software that they've provided at a heavy license cost. Whereas the smart zone is just a license per switch, there's no port licensing to use it in the smart zone, you can just manage the entire switch from it. So the next question is, I'd like to know about the firmware upgrade process. Okay, so there's a couple of ways we can do the firmware upgrade process. If you're using the smart zone, and I'll just go back to sharing my screen a moment. So the firmware upgrade process is really straightforward. So you would literally go on to switch 03, um, go on to more, click on schedule firmware, um, choose a firmware you would like, so 1892A for example, switch a router later, select a time of date, um, and then click OK, and then it would do that for you. Can you start different models in the same range? Yes, you can. So um, you can easily have a 7150ZP switch connected to a, uh, a non-POE switch at the very end. So we can do all of that as well. So we can have different models, as long as it's the same family. So 7150 can only stack to the 7150. Um, we can then have a 72 with a 7250. So we can't mix and match different families of switching. It has to stay within the same model family. General instruction on how to configure ICX products. So um, what I'll do is there is actually a cheat sheet that I've got and we'll send this out at the very end as part of the follow-up to this where I've actually created a Word document where you can literally find replace and it will go through all the basic configurations to get an ICX switch configured from the CLI um, and it will do everything for you. So you type in the IP address you want to give it in the template section, it'll copy that over to the live configuration. So you can literally copy and paste the configuration into your switch and we'll share that at the very end. Uh, it's a Word document, feel free to use it as much as you want, feel free to modify it, it's just using some clever macros. Um, so again we do, unfortunately um, for the cloud demo, um, it's only just been released and Ruckus haven't upgraded our cloud account, but what we've got, and Carla will be sending a link into the chat any moment now, um, there is a link to YouTube, which actually the Ruckus own branding of it. So you can actually go through and it goes how to create a lag group, shows you how to actually use the Ruckus switch in the cloud platform entirely. So please do feel free to watch that at the very end. Um, unfortunately, our account hasn't been upgraded in time for the webinar. It only got released last week. Um, and it's a manual process to upgrade our cloud instance at the moment. Um, so for anyone who's interested in cloud, however, if you were to buy a brand new cloud instance, you would actually have Ruckus switching capability straight away. It's only those of you which are on existing Ruckus Cloud platform that you have to manually request to be moved up. Um, but effectively, whatever you can do in the smart zone, you can do in Ruckus Cloud on the switching side of it, including the, all the same monitoring as well and configuration. So how do you configure um, LACP switch uh, ports on the switch? Okay, well, that's really simple. So got an example side by side. So we're going to create our lag group first. So we do this in the main configuration window. So we're going to give it lag name dynamic. So I've called mine LACP lag, um, sorry, lag LACP dynamic, give it an ID. So I've given it the ID of 10. I'm then going to determine which ports are going to be added to that lag group. So ports ethernet one slash one slash one, two, one slash one slash two. So I'm doing a range of ports. Um, then what we can do is we can treat that as a normal interface. So I'm going to go into interface lag 10 I'm then going to type in the command VLAN hyphen config add all tags. So I'm going to add all my VLANs to that tagged. Now, maybe I don't want to add all my VLANs as tagged. So what I can do is go into each individual VLAN interface. So VLAN 10, VLAN 20, and just type in tagged lag 10. And that's how I actually do that. Can you configure a voice VLAN using LLDP? Yes, you can. So um, we actually just use LLDP med values. So the one trick that you've got to be aware of is you need to have LLDP run enabled first and foremost. So you type in LLDP run in the main configuration. You then type in your network policy. So it's going to automatically 
um, apply the voice VLAN and you've got different DSCP values you, we can support. So we do support quality of service as well. Um, and we're going to apply that to the VLAN and then we're going to apply that to the Ethernet ports. And then we can also do the same for signaling as well. So there's obviously no point capturing the uh, voice quality of service packet if we're not going to capture the signaling packet to know when to start and stop the call. Can calls be set for VoIP? We can. Now, this is a really nice one. So um, you actually just have to type in voice VLAN and the VLAN ID if you're using a voice VLAN. If you're not and you don't have one set up, that's fine. You just need the command trust DSCP. What that means is we're going to honor any DSCP packet we, we have or we see. I'm going to simply send it all the way down the line so we can support our 802.1p uh, header and cross packet and we'll just pass it straight down the line. Can the configuration be visible by the Unleashed software? Yes, it can. So um, let me just share my screen again and we'll go and do a live demo of the Unleashed platform. Unleashed demo in the office. It's just going to log in. So here we can see our switches. Now, the nice thing about Ruckus Unleashed is that it automatically detects a switch and asks you if it can join the network. So um, this is in the office, our ICX demo switch. This is a switch it was connected to previously, and it's going to say, it's pending to join. Would you like us to join this to your network? Yes or no? So um, this is our demo switch. Here you can see the amount of ports that are uh, POE ports available and the power output. We can see the general info of the switch. So we can see the the model um, connected, yes or no. We can hide the port information. We can see the health, um, as well as showing any events and alarms. So if we look at the actual port configuration, now I will note that you can't do any configuration in Unleashed yet. You can only view configuration. So if I pick on our port 43 here, you can see it shows me how much uh, data has been sent, upload and download, um, including a total. We can then also see if you've got any VLAN tags across that. So we can see that we just use VLAN 1 for our testing. We can see how much PoE is being used versus the actual uh, requested power output. So if I go to port 1, we can actually see that port 1 has got lots of different tagged VLANs on there, which we use for testing, and that's our uplink. So that's the kind of thing you can see with Ruckus Unleashed. Um, Ruckus Unleashed doesn't have any API capability, Simon. Um, that is only a smart zone feature. Uh, and the smart zones do have full API integration into the switching as well. So what's the difference in configuration between ICX 7150 and 7250 switches? Uh, the short answer is there is none. You configure them in the exact same way. So the nice thing about Ruckus, in fact, all of their switches is it's the same CLI, same commands across every single switch. The only changes that are ever made are in firmware. So unless you've got switches on different firmware, um, that's the only time you'd see a difference in the CLI configuration commands. Will the latest versions obtain an IP address on an Ethernet network out of the box, or do they require console configuration? OK, so um, they can receive an IP address out of the box straight away. Um, I prefer to do it over console. Now, if you're running the latest firmware, which the switches are starting to ship with, which is 8090, SSH is actually enabled by default. Um, and the default username and password is super, and the password is sp-admin which means you can actually connect to it um, via the web interface and do the configuration on the web interface straight away. By default, can DHCP obtained address on an ICX router facing port be accessible from any other port on the same ICX? So providing that it's in the same VLAN on the same subnet, then yes, you can access the, sw the switch on any from any port on the switch. There's no rule to stop that unless you imply an ACL rule to prevent that from happening. What's the difference between the switch firmware UFI and non-UFI? Okay, great question. So, um, sorry for the blurb of text. Effectively, um, Ruckers have moved towards a secure boot image, which is called UFI, Unified Firmware Image. So what this also does is, previously, on the non-UFI firmware versions, you had to upgrade your POE firmware, you had to upgrade the boot code, you then had to upgrade the actual image code itself. So what they've done by using UFI is actually combine all of that into one switch. So this first came out in version 8080, um, and it simplifies the process. So you literally upgrade to the UFI firmware image, and that handles all the, all the firmware that the switch needs. So it'll handle the POE, the boot code, everything. Now, the really nice thing about this is that 
it'll actually then give you enhanced redundancy because previously you only had one boot code. Now you've got two partitions with boot code stored in both. So if one boot code becomes corrupted, the switch can fail over to the second boot code and load it from there and then recover from that. It also allows um, using the UFI bundle for all stack members to be upgraded. And there is a manifest file, so you can actually auto deploy firmware using the manifest file um, using TFTP. So what are the benefits of having rucker switches and APs? Um, okay, so realistically, it's a single pane of glass. You've got one platform that you can look at where it can use uh, a single pane of glass and it can look at everything. So you can click on an AP, the AP will tell you what switch port is connected to. The switch can tell you what firmware the AP is running. It can tell you how much data the AP is sent through that switch port. Um, you can then configure the switch port via the smart zone as well. Um, so it's really having that single pane of glass to do all troubleshooting for the APs and the switching in one place. So that is actually the end of the webinar. So sorry for a few technical difficulties that we had. Um, are there any questions? Feel free to post them and we can have a look. So we, um, okay, so I'm gonna start with what training does Perdicom offer? So um, we're actually the only training center in the UK that is certified to teach um, ICX switching as an accredited course with the exam at the very end. Um, so it's actually myself that does the ICX training and we go through all the feature sets in depth. So we go through campus fabric, multi chassis trunking. We do live lab demos as well. So we'll actually get you to play with the switches uh, build a stack, for example, and really get hands on. Uh, so um, the account managers can actually reach out to you and let you know how much that costs, but we can attend our offices. Or if you have an ICX switch, we can do a virtual classroom. Um, we've done a few now. Uh, what do you recommend configuring using uh, VE Ethernet? And what benefit does it have? So, Tom, we use that. If you're making your switch act as the router for the network, you need to have, or you may want to have different VLANs in different subnets. So VE, the virtual interface, is where you can actually assign a default gateway to each VLAN, and that VLAN can then route between each other VLANs. So Ravi, using the VPN module on the switches, can I establish a GRE tunnel? Yes, so it uses an IPsec tunnel to establish a tunnel between two endpoints. Cost asks, can you explain uh, a bit on how POE classes work one to four on the priorities? Um, so uh, the priorities or rather the classes are different classes determine different required POE outputs. Now, um, what that means is that class four will generally say that I need to have 15.4 watts of POE power, for example. Now that depends on if it's a a 82.3 AF or AT. Um, different priorities mean that if you have say, the switch runs out of power, you can say which ports are guaranteed power at any one time if it runs out. And that's the reason why you would do it. So hopefully that answers that question for you. Uh, Joseph, yes, um, so after this video, we're gonna collate the video. Um, Zoom has had a few issues, so we're gonna have to recode the video for you all, um, but we'll send that over to you with the slides as well as the video recording. And um, we'll also answer any questions as well. So hopefully today, if not, it'll be tomorrow. Um, we've just got to work out the issues we've had with Zoom today to actually get recorded. Okay, can you explain switch management licenses and what watchdog support is required for them? So, um, each, basically each switch needs to have a management license in the smart zone platform. So it's a rule of one, one license per switch. Um, so that's physical switches. So if there's two in a stack, you need to have two licenses for that switch stack. Um, watchdog support, so you can have end user or partner support. Um, so partner support would mean that the end user has to go through yourselves to gain support in which you could then go to Ruckus. End user support obviously means that they can contact Ruckus directly for any issues they've got with their switching. 
Um, yep, so you've signed up at the very end. Um, I'll send over the link. Um, let me just see if I've got a copy of it now, actually. Bear with me. I'll just dig it out of my slide deck. Um, and when I actually send over the Word doc, um, along with the video later on, um, and you can play around with that. Also, if anyone hasn't already, if you go to support.purdy.com, it's actually, you'll have to sign in, so you do need the store login. Um, and effectively, that's our entire knowledge base. So you've got a free knowledge base with lots of different um, guides and use cases in there on all of our products, not just Ruckus, for you to use and abuse as you see fit. Um, integrating an external cap to portal. So um, you could use CloudPath in conjunction with the ICX platform, and CloudPath would uh, generate the capture portal. It actually uses 802.1x, where CloudPath is being used as the 802.1x radio server effectively, and that can actually launch a capture portal where users can log in or could use Mac based authentication. Um, Luca, so on the 7650, could all ports at the rear of the chassis um, can be used for stacking at 40 gigs? So, yes, you can actually convert the 100 gig ports to be um, a stacking port as well. So the 7650 is a bit of an odd switch and they are actually changing the feature set later on when they're bringing the 7550 switch. So if you're using the rear, rear, rear ports for uplinking, you cannot use the front module, meaning you can't stack. However, if you're using the rear ports for stacking, you can use the front port at 40 gig or 100 gig networking. Okay, perfect. So, are there any more questions, guys? Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. Um, like I said, we'll get the video over to you later today, if not tomorrow. Um, we'll have a write-up for all the questions as well. And we'll get any additional thought things that we send, said we would send over, sent over as well with that. Thank you everyone for your time.